in a moment after break, but I want to bring in Mina Perez, uh, who uh, has been following um, the issue of voting rights and suppression with the Brennan Center. F stick with Florida. Sure. Um, Florida is an interesting case because you had one of the most restrictive laws uh, being passed by the state legislature that did a number of things. Uh, it put restrictions on third party registration groups, which are groups that go into our traditionally disenfranchised and disadvantaged communities, groups like the legal women voters who um, make you know, their bread and butter activities is including people in our democracy. And the restrictions that were passed made it so onerous that they had to close down shop for a little bit. That's also the same um, law that brought us uh, the early voting uh, reductions. Fortunately, um, like as it was the case with other laws around the country, the advocates and the voters fought back. And the courts um, definitely blocked and blunted a lot of the provisional, a lot of the aspects of this law that made it very difficult for voters. Now, we're still seeing some aftermath. One of the things that's obvious is that while the early voting uh, restrictions are better than they were before, there clearly is a demand and a need for more uh, early voting time. And one of the things that I like about the Florida story is that it speaks to a narrative of voters standing up for themselves. Um, here was a very suppressive piece of legislation, people trying to shut them out, and they responded in enormous numbers, being willing to wait in line, understanding that advocates have their back and are there trying to exercise their fundamental right to vote in the face of a legislature that passed laws trying to stifle it. So I, I think we need, to, we need to take away, you know, the very uh, powerful and very beautiful thing that is happening, which is people realizing that, you know, our right to vote is fundamental. It is something that we should not be uh, scared to exercise. And when it is challenged, we need to demand it. Are you getting many calls on your uh, voter protection hotline from Florida? Um, I am not in a call center that deals with Florida, um, but one of the things that we do know, and I do think that uh, the viewership should know, is that uh, if a voter has a problem, they should call 866-OUR-VOTE. It is a national nonpartisan hotline where there are trained legal volunteers who are able to answer questions that range from, I don't know where my polling location is, um, am I still registered on the books, or someone is asking me to present an identification. Um, this is the day where, as Americans, we all come together and our vote matters the same. It doesn't matter whether you are rich or poor, uh, you know, young or old, rich or not. Uh, like, and, and we need to make sure that we exercise that right and take advantage of the opportunity being given to us. It's our civic obligation. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion after break. Uh, Brenton Mock is with us. Uh, he is lead reporter for Voting Rights Watch 2012. And Myrna Perez, who is with the Brennan Center and is particularly involved with a voter protection hotline for people to call throughout today. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. How You Vote by Sonny Lenslim here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. This is Election Day 2012. Let's go to a comment from a former top advisor to Republican Senator John McCain of Arizona's 2008 uh, presidential campaign. Uh, appearing on MSNBC on Monday, Steve Schmidt dismissed concerns of ineligible voters casting ballots and said Republican-backed voter ID laws are based on mythology. 
whether you're a Democrat or Republican, is you want everybody who's eligible to vote to vote. And that's how you want to win elections. And so I think that all of this stuff that has transpired over the last two years is in search of a solution to a problem, voting fraud, that doesn't really exist when you when you look deeply at the question. But it's you now part, like of lost the, an election it's on part of the it's part of the mythology yeah. now in the in the Republican Party that there's widespread voter fraud all across the country. And in fact there's not. But both sides are, are lawyered up to the nth degree and uh and they'll all posture uh, back and forth on it, but it probably won't come down to the lawyer. Again, that's Steve Schmidt, who is the senior advisor to Senator John McCain when he was running for president. Uh, again, we are joined by Mina Perez. She is senior counsel at the Brennan Center uh, in the Democracy Program at New York University School of Law. And we're also joined uh, by Brenton Mock. Uh, Brenton Mock is lead reporter for Voting Rights Watch 2012, which is a collaboration between The Nation magazine and Colorlines.com. Uh, Mina Perez. Steve Schmidt's comment. He's a top Republican strategist, though I'm beginning to wonder if he's going to uh, switch his party affiliation listening to him these days. Oh. It's certainly the case that there is no dispute that our election system needs to be free and fair and full of integrity. The dispute is over what means people are going to take in order to ensure that, and how many people are going to be disenfranchised in the process. And uh, the evidence documents that the kinds of restrictive laws that are being passed do not do anything to make or do very little. Uh, if anything at all, to make our elections more secure. But what they do do is make it very difficult for eligible Americans to participate and to vote. And the question that we as Americans have to ask ourselves is how many barriers are we going to put in front of the ballot box between eligible Americans and their fundamental right? And we need to make sure that we are not uh, the victims of manipulation by partisans who want to uh, rig the rules of the game such that they can be making the decisions as to who gets to participate and who doesn't. One of the examples that I'd like to, to use is the Texas um, photo identification requirement that is not going to be in place. Um, the list of acceptable ID was created with such, like, target precision that there was a decision made that if you had a University of Texas ID, you couldn't use that to vote. But if you had a concealed gun license, you could. Um, that's a specific kind of targeting of certain voters to make sure that some people have a voice and those uh, voices that politicians so, don't want to hear wouldn't from. Wouldn't that be struck down by a court immediately? Well, the court the court did block the implementation of this, so it's not going to be uh, in place. Um, but, uh, but I think the— But the that's just, not striking it down. It's just— delaying implementation. Right now, it cannot be implemented. It was challenged under uh, the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of the preclearance provision, and it had did not, the state did not meet its burden that it was not going to make uh, minority and poor voters worse off. So that is not a law that people have to worry about in Texas. But you raise a very, very important point. There was so much back and forth of this, right up to the wire, that there's great confusion in Texas over what the ID requirements are. We're already getting reports that people during early voting are being asked for identification that is not required. Um, the voter registration cards that the state sends out are misleading and suggests that the uh, that the photo identification law, the stringent law that is not in place, is actually in place. And we see examples of like that, of the voter confusion happening in a number of instances, also in Pennsylvania, even though the law will not be in place. Um, we saw two websites in the county, you know, still have the old information when the law was active. And that's why it's really important when voters are unsure sure or hear something that does not feel right, they need to call 866-R-VOTE, where we have up-to-date information and we'll be able to help them out. Uh, Brenton Mock, let's go to Virginia. Now, Virginia is going to tell us a lot. Now, Democracy Now! begins our broadcast tonight at 7 o'clock until 1 in the morning. That's Eastern time. Um, we'll be broadcasting at democracynow.org online, and many public radio and television stations around the country will be running our election special. 7 o'clock is when we start. 7 o'clock is when the polls in Virginia close. Brent and Mock talk about what's happening in Virginia, a key swing state. Right. And Virginia mirrors Florida uh, in a lot of different ways, um, particularly with its felony disenfranchisement law. Uh, you know, Virginia joins Florida as one of the states that permanently, permanently disenfranchises anyone who has a felony conviction in their background. And you, that person has to appeal directly to the governor to have their voting rights restored. Uh, also, like Florida, there's up to a five-year wait for you to even be able to apply 
uh, to have your voting rights restored if you have that felony conviction. Uh, but unlike Florida, uh, Virginia didn't have an early voting uh, period. So right now in Florida, which we understand, we already know, is a much larger state than Virginia, but Virginia is not Rhode Island by any means. I mean, there are a lot of people in this state who are going to be lined up to vote uh, today. Uh, they, in fact, they're probably already there at the polls. Uh, and we saw five, six, seven-hour line uh, waits during uh, in Florida during early voting periods there. Uh, I can imagine what the lines look like here in Florida and Virginia, where there's been absolutely no uh, early voting. Uh, talk about Fairfax County uh, Elections Board um, and the man they have spearheading uh, their, well, uh, voting rights laws and how they're implemented. Right. So <clears throat> Fairfax County, uh, which is a very important county uh, in this campaign, in, the, in this presidential race, so important that Mitt Romney is having his uh, post-election uh, I hate to call it a party. He's, he's going to have his post-election event tonight here in Fairfax uh, County. Uh, that's how important it is to the Republican Party. Place it first uh, geographically in, in Virginia and why it's so significant. Right. And, well, basically, I'm sorry, what was the question? Place it for us, Fairfax County, within Virginia, geographically, and why it's so significant. In Virginia, right. Um, I mean, it's, it's a— it's a swing county. Uh, for the most part, it's, uh, you know, where, how Fairfax goes is basically how Virginia will go. And Virginia itself is a swing state. It was important to Obama winning the election in 2008. And Romney, basically, uh, for him to be able to win this year, he's going to need Virginia. And But, you know, Fairfax is really going to be the weather vane of, 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 of how Virginia goes. And here in the election board, uh, the Board of Elections uh, sits hands Von Spakovsky, uh, who, is, who has been the architect of a number of different voter suppression laws. Uh, he is a research fellow at the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative uh, think tank. Um, baby, this this part, he's a, a huge proponent of voter ID laws. Uh, he's been a huge promoter of the purging programs that we saw happening in Florida with Governor Rick Scott. Uh, in fact, Talking Points memo reported uh, earlier this year that when uh, Governor Scott was uh, being uh, Florida's Governor Rick Scott was being sued uh, because of his purging program. Uh, that he began to call on people to help really promote this, uh, to really spin it in the media to make it sound like the purging was a good thing. And one of the big, excuse me, one of the main people that he called uh, was Hans von Spakovsky. And so now Hans von Spakovsky is sitting in the Fair Fairfax County uh, Board of Elections uh, with a huge amount of discretion over uh, which votes will be counted and which will not. And his significance, why he should have so much power? I don't think he should. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, it, you know, a lot of very smart election law experts uh, believe that, you know, these kinds of election boards should be taken out of partisan hands and, and, and put into completely independent, nonpartisan, uh, uh, you know, operators. Uh, but right now, we know for a fact that Hans von Spakovsky is, is by no means a, a, a nonpartisan person. He, he is a, he's a very conservative uh a uh, blogger who works with one of the most conservative organizations out there, with the Heritage Foundation. He's one of the top advisors uh, to True the Vote, one of their most trusted advisors, actually. Uh, and he has shared the stage, uh, you know, not only with True the Vote's uh, founder, Catherine Engelbrecht, but also with some of the uh, secretaries of state uh, in some of the other battleground states uh, throughout, um, throughout the nation, such as Colorado's secretary of state, Scott Gessler. Uh, he shared uh, plenty of thoughts and, and, and ideas um, on stage with uh, South Carolina's attorney general when, when they were fighting against the Department of Justice to have their voter ID law implemented. I mean, this is a person who, at least for the last 20, 30 years, has done everything in his power to try to restrict voting rights for citizens. Uh, and Jane Meyer uh, in The New Yorker uh, wrote an excellent profile of Hans von Spakovsky to, to really detail uh, not only the, the, the pure partisanship that he engages in, but also the drumming up of the, of the voter fraud mythology. Uh, he, he has been one of the main trumpeters of this idea that uh, voter fraud uh, exists. And, you know, she categorically debunked basically every single example that he provided uh, where he tried to say that, that voter fraud had helped to uh, swing an election.
Uh, Mirna Perez, can you talk about what's happening in New York and New Jersey? We have this crisis, uh, Superstorm Sandy in New York, 40,000 residents are displaced. Um, Governor Chris Christie in New Jersey is saying that people will be able to email in their votes. Governor Cuomo has just issued an executive order. You can vote anywhere, but that means you can't vote down ballot. Uh, and you can explain what that means. You can vote for president, but not if, you know, if the place you're going to vote has a state senator you would want to vote for or whatever, where you were living, you can't then vote in someone else's district for the state senator there. Right. Well, I mean, I think there are a couple of takeaways. Um, one is this was an extraordinary circumstance. We had a terrible, terrible storm. Many people were displaced. Uh, many rescue workers um, can't be where they're supposed to be because they were trying to keep people safe and to put lights on and to make sure that uh, that people uh, were found and have the basic necessities. And we saw two governors uh, take creative and unusual measures to try and make sure that people's fundamental right to vote could still be exercised. Um, in New York, uh, the governor made it such that certain uh, certain counties and people that live in certain areas that were federally declared to be emergency zones could vote by affidavit ballot anywhere they were at. And yes, it is the case that um, they will not be able to vote for what sometimes people call down ticket races, and, and that's a very practical reason. The ballots are the ballots are created for the for the location that they're at, and um, and I think while there may be some lacking to that, what we do need to take away is that somebody was trying to account for the very unique situation that we're in and trying to uh, provide a means for voters to be able to participate and to not be shut out. Now in New Jersey, um, they did two things. Um, one of them is getting more press than the other. One of them is the email. Um, that is a that is something that um, in 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 my view uh, is is something that we shouldn't look at right now as a long term solution because there are still technological kinks that need to get locked out and as a, uh, worked out and as a practical matter if you don't have power or you don't have electricity the fact that you can email or fax your ballot in is of cold comfort and not likely to be much good to you but like. New York, there is a provision for people to be able to vote if they are somewhere else. As long as they're in the state and as long as they're registered, it is going to have to be provisional. Um, what I do want to tell— I mean, interesting on email is that, I mean, if they're talking about any long-term solution, like people say, oh, why don't we do that all over? It goes to issues of privacy. People well, know who's voting for who. And it also goes to issues of technological security, and we need to make sure there's not glitches in computers and that people can have it. I mean, it's something that certainly reformers and advocates and some advocates um, look at as a possibility, but, um, you know, I, I don't think we're there yet as a permanent solution. Um, maybe one day the facts will change, but um, we cannot underestimate the importance, though, of the provisional balloting um, option, because that will not rely on electricity. It will allow people to vote from— And that is? That is, uh, if they are displaced and uh, they are registered to vote, they can cast a provisional ballot. Um, where uh, where that's closest to them, and like in New York, it will be counted as a ma as an operation. What's state interesting law. in New York and New Jersey is they're not considered swing states. They're both uh, believed to be voting for Obama, and if many fewer people vote, um, it sort of goes to this whole question of the electoral college that the possibility that President Obama could win the electoral college, which would mean winning the presidency, but not win the popular vote, um, and this would further that that there would be fewer people voting. Well, I think as Americans, we should focus less on the horse race and about the voters. I mean, if there are fewer people voting because of a natural disaster, it is appropriate, I think, for the governors to take measures to make sure that more people can vote. And in my view, it doesn't matter whether or not uh, the elections are close or they're not. People have a fundamental right to vote. The vote means something to people. It, our democracy is more robust the more people participate. And that's what these two, uh, these two measures are designed to do, to try and make it such that more people can participate, notwithstanding this, this horrible natural disaster that has happened. Hmm. Um, final comments, uh, Brenton, for what people should understand about what's happening right now. And we hope to have both of you back on tonight at some point during our special broadcast to report on what you found throughout the day. <clears throat> well, what, what I would like to do is just— um, you know, give my highest salute to the voters themselves. Um, sometimes uh, reporters such as myself 
we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to report on and expose people who are trying to suppress the vote. Uh, but at the same time, uh, voters are not stupid. Americans are not stupid. They are resilient. Uh, we have technology at our hands. Uh, and people, you know, have been showing in, at these elections that they are not going to let any obstacles come between them and the vote. Um, I mean, it's, it's true. We should not have seven, eight-hour lines of voting. But the positive thing is that people are actually waiting seven or eight hours to vote, and they're not letting anything not true to vote, not bomb scares, not people not disallowing water to be handed out to them to stop them from, from going out to vote. And, and it's a true testament not only to the voters, uh, but also to groups like the Brennan Center for Justice, which has been putting out the information proactively and aggressively long uh, before uh, election time came, and also to the election protection teams who have been out there uh, willing and, 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 and to help anyone who, who needed anything. Um, but right now, what we're seeing is democracy in action. Very quickly, Marina, on immigrants, a final comment. For people who are afraid you know, that they are absolutely allowed to vote, but what if they could be investigated, their fear that someone in their family could be deported, uh, the, the whole questioning of immigrants and their rights to vote? Okay. If someone is an eligible American and they are registered to vote and they have not been disenfranchised because of a criminal conviction or mental adjudication, um, they have the right to vote. If someone is attempting to suppress that, there are people that will help you. Call 866-OUR-VOTE. Report it. We will, uh, we will do our best to counter the information. We will make sure that the election officials uh, know about what's going on. We will put media scrutiny on the issue. Uh, every eligible American that is registered should participate. And on the issue of prisoners um, in the states and ex-convicts, uh, um, uh, felons, the varying laws across the country. Mm -hmm. I remember speaking to a friend a while ago when I said, are you going out to vote today? He said, I can't. And he talked about the state he was in, and he said he's never been able to vote. And I looked it up, and he was actually right. able to vote. Right. And people do not know, because these laws vary from state to state. That's exactly right. The first time I was on your show, it was about that. Um, we are a patchwork when it comes to how our state laws disenfranchised persons with criminal convictions. We have some states like Maine and Vermont where you never lose your right to vote. You can you vote can even vote for from prison. prison. You can vote from prison. Um, and one of the problems that happens when you have this patchwork is that there's misinformation. People don't understand, um, you know, what the rules is, are in their state. And one the states of, where you never, ever can vote again? Well, when there's bright lines, that tends to be easier. Maine and Vermont, they tend to have not trouble mm -hmm. because they know that. You know, Kentucky and Virginia, they tend to know, they tend to be okay because they know what are the bright lines are. What you have, uh, when you have the most problems are states like New York, where you can vote if you are on probation, but not if you're on parole. Um, and one of the things that is really important is that um, that people not disenfranchise themselves because they don't understand the state law. Because what frequently happens is somebody will have bad information, and then they'll tell their cousin, and then they'll tell their girlfriend, and then they'll tell their girlfriend's best friend. And then you have these entire mm -hmm. communities being misinformed so about what, what their rights are. Um, you can call 866-OUR-VOTE, and we can uh, mm -hmm. let you know what the state law is. But uh, you should do that before election time. You should look up what your state rules are. If you are eligible to vote, you should register to vote. There are people that um, can walk you through the process. And you have to re-register if you were imprisoned and it depends it depends on the state that's a that's so a should just call. yeah it's a complicated issue that has to deal with what their list maintenance uh, procedures and there's no one uh, right size i want to thank you both for being with us mirna perez is senior counsel in the democracy program at the brennan center for justice at new york university school of law part of the election protection coalition's voter support hotline their number 866 our vote and thank you so much to brenton mock lead reporter for voting rights march 2012 a collaboration between the nation magazine and colorlines.com We'll link to your latest article, and we hope to speak to you both tonight to get the latest at the end of this historic day. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report.